It is. Hey, we're recording. No, I should start now. Okay. Oh, he wants to introduce me. Well, start right now. <laughs> yes, thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Stallman. He, uh, uh, since 1983, I believe, has been uh, heavily involved with the uh, free software community. Um, he founded the Free Software Foundation in 1985 um, and is involved in the uh, GNU Public License. Um, GNU General Public License. Sorry. <laughs> the GNU General Public License. You have to mention um, And I'm sure Richard will explain the difference. Um, and uh, so please welcome Black Richard Stallman. This is not a talk about free software. This is the answer, this talk is to answer a question that people sometimes used to ask me at the end of talks about free software. By the way, would it be possible to bring some water? Or even better, a regular Pepsi, if that's available. Uh, so in order for it to make sense, I better start by telling you about what free software means, at least. So, Free software is software that respects the user's freedom. It's free in the sense of freedom. We're not talking about price. When I say free software, I don't mean gratis software. I mean freedom respecting software. So think of free speech, not free beer, to understand the word free when it's used in the expression free software. Software which is not free is proprietary software, user-subjugating software. It keeps the users divided and helpless. Divided because they're forbidden to share it with anyone else. And helpless because they can't see the source code. They don't have it. So they can't change the program. They can't even verify independently what it's really doing to them. And often it does something intentionally nasty. For instance, there are malicious features to spy on users, there are malicious features to restrict users, and there are malicious features to attack users, back doors. One proprietary program you may have heard of, which has all three kinds of malicious features, is known as Microsoft Windows. <laughs> Microsoft Windows in recent versions has a back door that allows Microsoft to install any changes it might wish in the software forcibly without asking the users for permission. And don't think that Microsoft is uniquely evil. Uh, we know that Mac OS has two of these kinds of malicious features. It has features designed to restrict the user, and it has a similar backdoor allowing Apple to forcibly change the software in any way without asking permission. That doesn't look like Pepsi. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, I was afraid it was Coca-Cola. But it isn't. Sorry, my mistake. There is a worldwide boycott of Coca-Cola Company for murdering union organizers in Colombia. Take a look at killercoke.org for more information about that. But getting back to the topic. So it turns out that a lot of proprietary programs have malicious features. And the reason is proprietary software gives the developer power over the users. And if the power belongs to a company which is always looking for ways to make more money, it's likely to try to use the power it has to gain increased power and increased power. And where that leads often is the back door giving them total power, including the power to change the software and put in new malicious features whenever they like. So, more, however, what I've said is rather general. I should be more precise because it's easy to say I'm in favor of freedom. I stand for freedom. And even Bush used to say that. 
and Bush didn't know how to recognize freedom either before or after he had crushed it. <laughs> so I better explain more what I mean by freedom here. A program is free software if it gives you, the user, the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do what you wish. The free freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make and then distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And then freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. These four freedoms, first of all, ensure that each user individually has control over the program, but also give any community of users collective control over the program. And these both exist in parallel. The community generally decides what to do with the program, and you can participate in that decision as much as you wish, because that's, that decision is simply the sum total of individual decisions. But if you don't like what some community decides to do with the program, you're never bound by that because you can always decide to change it yourself or pay someone else to change it for you and get exactly what you want to the extent you're willing to go to the, the effort to do so. So with free software, we have individual freedom and social solidarity and democracy because the, the decision of the community is made with everyone's participation. With proprietary software, we have the autocracy of the developer. The proprietary program functions as an instrument to impose the developer's power on the users, whom the developer can then command, mistreat, and exploit. Of course, some masters are nastier than, than other masters, but to be free means you don't have a master. And in computing, to be free means that you use free software. So, I started the free software movement in 1983, and I announced a plan to develop a free software operating system, which is called GNU. And GNU stands for GNU's Not Unix. It's a recursive acronym. And when GNU was almost finished in 1992, there was one important <laughs> missing piece. That was the kernel, which is the program that allocates the machine's resources to the other programs that you run. And then somebody else who had written a kernel called Linux decided to make it free software. And once Linux became free software, it filled the last gap in GNU. So we had a complete free operating system, which was basically GNU, but it also contained Linux. In other words, it's the GNU plus Linux system. Unfortunately, when these, this combination was made, a confusion got started and people started calling the whole system Linux, as, and that gives people the idea that the whole thing was done by that other guy. Well, it wasn't. The reason there's a free operating system is not because he sort of is a... It's not because of his sole contribution, which he made as an afterthought. The reason the system exists is because the GNU project was working for most of a decade before that to bring a free system into existence. And that's why when he contributed that piece, all the other pieces were already there. It was no accident. That was our goal, to make a free operating system. Anyway, once people started to use the GNU plus Linux system, uh, I started getting invited to give more speeches. Because even though people thought mistakenly that Mr. Torvalds had start, developed the system, they knew I had something to do with it. Uh, and at the end of the speech about free software, 
in which I would usually explain the reasons why each of these four freedoms is essential and then talk about the history and the threats we face. But people often ask, do these ideas apply to anything other than software? Like, what about hardware? Should hardware be free? Well, I think that's just being, that's, that's a blithe generalization that doesn't really make much sense. Let's see whether the same four freedoms make sense for hardware and what conclusions we would draw about them. Uh, well, should hardware give you these four freedoms? Let's look at them one by one. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. This would become the freedom for a physical object. This would become the freedom to use the object as you wish. And you are. The manufacturer doesn't make you sign a license about what you're going to do with the product. If you buy a wooden chair, the, the, there's no license saying which kinds of changes you can make, or whether you can sit on it, or whether you can burn it, or all those other things you know, uh, that you might do with it. So you've got freedom zero. Of course, there's some things you're not allowed to do at all. You know, If you picked up the chair and hit somebody with it, that would be a crime. But that's not a restriction placed on the chair by its manufacturer. That's just a general rule that you're not allowed to hit people. So uh, in terms of the use of the chair itself, you are free. And then let's look at freedom one, the freedom to study the source code of the program and then change it to make the program do what you wish. When we try to transfer this to physical objects, we run into a snag, which is that there is no source code for physical objects. Uh, so we have to adapt some. We could say freedom one is the freedom to study and change the object itself. We could say the object is its own source code. It's the closest thing there is in, in most cases. And then what we find is you have freedom one, except that the practical ability to exercise it is often limited by practical factors. So for instance, if you have a wooden chair, there are a lot of changes you could actually make to it. You could carve uh, sculpture into the uh, parts of the chair. You could paint it. You could reupholster it. You could do all sorts of things to it. A metal chair is much harder. Uh, a computer chip is basically impossible to change. You would destroy it if you tried. So the end. But the manufacturers don't put arbitrary restrictions on you when they sell it to you about the changes. If you're limited, it's, it's by the facts, not by somebody's will. So you've got freedom one to the extent it's feasible, but that's often rather limited. What about freedom two? The freedom to copy it and distribute the copies. Well, that's, that's a meaningless question because there are no copiers for most kinds of physical objects. Now, for instance, is somebody allowed to make a copy of your car and drive it away? We could imagine sometime in, in, in science fiction that there are car copiers. And someone could walk up with his car copier, attach one end to your car, and then out the other end grow another car just like it, except we hope with a different lock. And then he could pick up his car copier, which I suppose would make a key corresponding to his lock, and then he would get into the copy and drive it away, and you wouldn't notice because your car would be unchanged. Well, if we had that kind of technology, the question of whether people are free to use it would be an important question. But since we don't have it, we don't even need to worry about the question. We can leave that to some time in the future when somebody invents a car copy. And likewise, freedom three is a meaningless question in practice. Suppose you've modified a chair or modified a car. People do these things. Still, there are no copiers. So the question of whether you should be allowed to copy the modified chair or modified car and hand out copies is a meaningless question. So what we find out is that physical objects generally are as free as they could be, but 
the ability to exercise these freedoms is in many cases limited or non-existent. You wanted to ask something? Yes. What's your definition of software? Uh, software, I don't have a precise definition because we generally know what it is, but it's, it's, a, so it's a kind of data that controls the actions of a machine when you load it into the machine and tells the machine what to do. I, I ask because there are some physical things that we could apply to uh, rules to. For example, the document that's not software. Well, actually, if you let me get to that. Okay. I, I prefer to get the questions at the end, uh, but I responded to you since you had your hand up. Uh, so for physical objects in general, that question was a silly question, and I'm sure the people who asked it knew it was a silly question. But there are other things which it is quite feasible to copy and change. That is, other kinds of works made of information. You could have a copy of those works in your computer, and you can use the computer to change them and to copy them. And because it is feasible to do those things, the question of whether you're allowed to do them is it a meaningful and important question. And that question is what this talk is about. Now, if you have a copy of a work that isn't software, then in almost all cases, the only thing that would stop you from doing any of these things a published work, I mean. The, the, the only thing that would stop you is copyright law. That's not true for software. In fact, the main ways of making software non-free are not copyright, although that's one of them. Contracts are used, and just withholding the source code from the users is also used. Uh, and there are other ways as well. Copyright's not the only way. But with other kinds of works, there is there is no crucial distinction between source code and the work as you would look at it. If you're reading text, what you see is the work. There isn't any source code which is more understandable than the words you read. Uh, and likewise, if you look at a picture, there, there's no other form of that which makes more sense than the picture itself in most cases. So usually the question of source code doesn't even arise for other kinds of works. Uh, so what we find is that the question of what you're allowed to do with the work is the same as the question, what does copyright say about the work? The same question asked from two opposite directions, but finding out the same answer. So the topic is, what should copyright say about what you can do with your copies of published works? To look at this, it's interesting to look at the history of copyright law, which is connected with the history of copying technology. Uh, now, changes in technology can't affect our ethical principles, which are too deep to be reached by this. But when we apply our principles to an actual question, we do it by looking at the consequences of our possible choices and evaluating them according to our principles. So a change in the context can alter the consequences of an action we could take and make it more good or more bad. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so bad. The judge would say, you killed him, now you're going to pay for his new body. And that's that. And in the US, we would probably have to carry uninsured murderer insurance. <laughs> but in civilized countries, the National Health Service would just take care of it. So it's interesting to look at the history of copying technology and copyright. Now, copying technology began in the ancient world, where copying was done by reading a copy and writing another copy. Now, this copying technology was very inefficient, but it had other interesting consequences. First of all, it had no economy of scale. To make 10 copies this way took 10 times as long as making one copy. Uh, also, it required no special equipment beyond the equipment you used to write and it required no special skill 
aside from literacy itself. The result was that copies were made in a decentralized way. Wherever somebody had a copy and wanted another, he could copy it. Now, there was nothing like copyright in the ancient world, as far as I can tell. If you had a copy and you wanted to make another, nobody would try to stop you or claim you weren't allowed to do this, except perhaps if the local prince didn't like what the book said, in which case he might do all sorts of things to you. Now, this, however, was not copyright. It was something very closely related, namely censorship. And to this day, copyright is often used as a way of keeping information or opinions out of the reach of the public. Well, the ancient world existed for a long time, and then there was a tremendous advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying a lot more efficient, but not uniformly more efficient. Because the printing press is only superior when you're making many identical copies. So the printing press took us from this situation to this situation mass production copying much more efficient, but making one copy at a time didn't benefit at all because the best way to do that was by hand, not by the printing press. You see, the printing press has an economy of scale. It takes a lot of time to set the type, but once that's done, you can quickly make many identical copies. It takes longer to set the type than it does to write a copy by hand. So you'd only use the printing press when you wanted to make many identical copies. In addition, the printing press and the type were expensive equipment. Most literate people didn't own these. Also, using them was a totally different skill from writing. Uh, most literate people didn't know how to use a printing press, although I suppose most of them could have figured it out if they had to. Uh, but the point is, because of these differences in technology, we got a centralized system of making copies. The copies of any given work were made in a few places and then they were transported to whoever wanted to buy them. During the first few centuries of printing, many people still made copies by hand. A large fraction of copies were still made by hand, typically either for very rich people to show how rich they were, or by poor people, because as the song goes, time ain't money if all you got is time. That song was popular in the 30s, and maybe next year it'll be popular again. <laughs> so there were poor people who couldn't afford printed copies of books, but they had time on their hands, and they could write copies for themselves. This happened a lot. Uh, copyright began in the age of the printing press. It fit naturally with the centralized mass production characteristics of the printing press. For instance, in Italy in the 1500s, it apparently was the custom that you could ask various princes to give you a monopoly on printing something. And if they liked you, they would generally, if that you, if you, it, Princes back then tended to give out monopolies over anything but, uh, as a way of rewarding whoever they wished to reward, but there was a custom that someone who wrote a book would, would usually be able to get that kind of monopoly. Copyright in England began as a system of censorship. At the time, it, I believe it was censorship of Protestantism. And this was in the 1500s, and so to publish a book, one had to ask the crown for permission, which was granted as a perpetual monopoly to one publisher. Now, this system of censorship became obsolete in uh, the late 1600s, and people began rethinking what they wanted to do with this system of approval for publication. And in the early 1700s, they changed the system. They started giving copyrights to authors 
and I believe it was for 14 years, renewable once. Uh, and the idea arose that copyright would be an artificial way of encouraging writing. When the US Constitution was written, there was a proposal to make the Constitution entitle authors to a copyright. Uh, you'd never believe it to hear what the media companies say these days, but in fact that proposal was rejected. And instead the Constitution says, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by reserving to authors and inventors for a limited time the exclusive use of their respective writings and discoveries. Now, what we see here are three important points. First of all, the Constitution doesn't require a copyright system. It just authorizes one, supposing Congress decides to set it up. Otherwise, it looks like copyright wouldn't be allowed at all. Uh, second, if there is a copyright system, its purpose is not uh, benefit, to provide special privilege and benefit to certain private parties. The purpose is to promote progress, which is a public benefit. So the justification for having copyright at all is a public benefit, namely progress. And the third point is that copyright has to last for a limited time. Now, copyright in the age of the printing press functioned as an industrial regulation, or an industrial regulation imposed on publishers, controlled by authors, and all of it set up to provide benefit to the public. Because it functioned as an industrial, it was an industrial regulation because it didn't restrict what readers could do. If you were restricted by it, it was because you were a publisher. As a result, it was easy to enforce, uncontroversial for the most part, and arguably beneficial. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers, and that's easy to do. It doesn't require invading everybody's home and everybody's computer. You just go to a bookstore and you say, where did you get these copies? Uh, it was uncontroversial because the readers, not being restricted in the things that they could feasibly do, had no complaints. And it was arguably beneficial because the way it was understood in the U.S. legal tradition is the, the general public, the readers, had traded away part of their natural right to copy anything in exchange for a, a natural right which they were entitled to but which they were unable to exercise because they didn't have printing presses. And in exchange they got the benefits of more writing, which were real benefits. Now, if you have something that you can't use and you trade it to somebody for something of some value to you, it's a positive trade. Uh, whether it's the best deal you could have got, that's a second order question, but at least you gained something. And since this, these freedoms were freedoms we couldn't exercise, we didn't complain about this deal. And so, if we were still back in the middle of the age of the printing press, I doubt I would be criticizing the copyright system. In the, age, in the age of the printing press, nobody tried to use copyright to stop people from individually making copies. Now, it's true that about a century ago, printing presses got a lot more efficient and books became a lot cheaper. That's when paperback books began. And at that point, even poor people could generally buy copies. They didn't have to write them by hand. But still, copyright continued to act as an industrial regulation. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks, 
another advance in copying technology which makes copying more efficient and once again not uniformly more efficient. Because the age of the printing press gave us this, mass production very efficient, one-off copying still just as slow as before. Computer technology gives us this, where they're both much more efficient than anything ever was before. And mass production is, uh, is distinctly more efficient than one-off copying still, but the difference is not as big as it was in the age of the printing press. And one-off copying is now sufficiently efficient that hundreds of millions of people can do it and do do it and want to be free to do it. As a result, even if copyright law were unchanged from 50 years ago, the effect would be totally different because now the effect is a restriction on every citizen stopping us from doing things that we want to do and that are useful. So copyright law, even the old text, even copyright law from 50 years ago, if it hadn't been changed, would no longer function as an industrial regulation, but instead as a restriction on the general public controlled by the publishers in the name of the authors, with rare exceptions. So the justification disappears. The circumstances that made it acceptable disappear. The reason disappears. So what governments that were democratic and wanted to serve the interests of their citizens would say at this point is this deal which traded away some of our citizens' freedom has become unacceptable and we have to reclaim some of that freedom for our citizens so that they can exercise it. That's what they want, that's what they deserve, and that's what they will get. We can measure the lack of real democracy in governments around the world by their tendency to do the exact opposite, to extend copyright power beyond what it was in the age of the printing press. For instance, there's the dimension of time. In the past few decades, copyright, the, the length of time copyright lasts has been extended over and over in the US. The last extension was in 1998. Copyright was extended by 20 years for both past and future works, supposedly in order to promote authorship. But how this law could possibly encourage the now dead authors of the 20s and 30s to write more back then <laughs> escapes me. If they have a time machine, apparently they didn't use it. Because our history books don't record that the authors of that age learned that their copyrights were going to be extended and so they set to work writing with a will why don't they use the time machine and tell them? <clears throat> now, it's at least conceivable that 20 more years of copyright for a future work would convince somebody to go to the trouble of writing it. But not anybody rational. Because economists will tell you that the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting many decades in the future uh, if, if you're an individual author, it would be long after you're dead. Uh, if you're a company deciding to pay people to write it, well, they used to have 75 years of copyright, so this would be 20 more years starting, 75 years in the future. The discounted present value of this is so small, it wouldn't rationally motivate any business to decide anything. Uh, and any business that claims that these 20 more years are needed ought to substantiate its claim by presenting its projected balance sheets for 75 years in the future. <laughs> really what went on was some companies wanted to continue their existing monopolies on works that were made long in the past. 
and everything else was just, and they paid congressmen to vote for this, and everything else was just an excuse. For instance, Disney was aware that the copyright on the first films in which Mickey Mouse appeared as a character were going to expire in a short time. And once that happened, anybody else would be allowed to use, to draw Mickey Mouse in, in some artistic work. Uh, and uh, Disney has got a lot from the public domain, but doesn't ever want to give anything back. So Disney was among those that uh, essentially paid congressmen to vote for this, which is why we call it the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act. The Constitution doesn't allow a perpetual copyright, but the movie companies say they want perpetual copyright. Now, they're not quite powerful enough yet to pass a constitutional amendment, so they worked out a way of getting effectively the same result without one, which has been described as perpetual copyright on the installment plan. Every 20 years, they're going to extend copyright by 20 more years. This way, if you point at any work, nominally there is some date when it will go into the public domain. But that date is like tomorrow. It never comes. By the time you get there, they will have postponed it. And thus, it will never go into the public domain. At least that's their intention. That's what they will do if we don't stop them. But time is only one of the dimensions that's relevant. There's also the dimension of breadth. What uses of a copyrighted work does copyright control? Now, in the age of the printing press, it was not supposed to control all uses of a published copyrighted work. Uh, the uses controlled by copyright were an exception in a broader space of unregulated uses that everyone was still free to do. However, the publishers think that with digital technology, they can seize total control. They want to set up a pay-per-read universe in which anything we do with copyrighted works requires their approval. And the way they do this is with digital restrictions management, or DRM, designing products to restrict you. The idea is they publish the works in some kind of encrypted form, or more generally, blocking access somehow. And then they control all the players so that all the players are designed to restrict you. Now, this is generally established by a conspiracy of companies. It's very rare that one company by itself can do this. Normally, it's a conspiracy. So, for instance, the first place the public encountered this was in DVDs. The video on a DVD is typically encrypted for the specific purpose of restricting the people who are going to view, who buy the DVDs and then want to use their copies. All the authorized players are designed to restrict the public just the same. And this is because the conspiracy enforces this. Anybody that wants to get permission to make a DVD player is required to join the conspiracy. And part of joining the conspiracy is promising to build that DVD player to restrict the user just like all the other DVD players according to the rules of the conspiracy. I'd really prefer to have the questions. I was just going to mention that I think Macrovision ACP was before DVD and it was pretty bad too. Uh, that is that, is that digital restrictions management? I don't know if it was digital. It's not digital, but it's But it was the same spirit. The same spirit. Thank you. So, uh, this is why all the DVD players restrict you the same. Now, you might wonder how I know about this conspiracy. A conspiracy of companies to restrict the public's access to technology ought to be a felony. 
justice, a conspiracy to set prices would be a felony. But they are completely certain that our government is on their side against us. And they have absolutely no fear that they will ever be prosecuted for this. And as a result, they don't even bother to keep their conspiracies secret. They announce these conspiracies. That's how I know. They say what their rules are. Now, originally they thought that nobody would ever figure out how to way to break their digital handcuffs. But people figured out the format of DVDs and released a free program cable that you can use to watch the video on a DVD. And, you could, and because it wasn't made according to the rules of the conspiracy, you could also use it to copy the DVD. So this software is available, but distributing it in the US is forbidden. The US practices censorship of software. That was enacted in 1998 as part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Censorship of software. So, <clears throat> uh, if you're in the US, one of the few rights that nominally still remains to you is the right that if you buy a DVD, you can watch it. But the free software you can watch it with is uh, forbidden for anyone to provide to you. And the same companies have been lobbying for laws along the same lines in other countries. Uh, in France, even to possess a copy of this free program is a crime that people can be imprisoned for. Shows just how strongly committed the French government is to the cause of the mega corporations against the citizens of France. <clears throat> However, the movie companies are aware that no matter how nasty their laws become, they can't get rid of this program. So they designed a, f a new scheme of digital restrictions management called AACS, which was meant as the follow-on. And they figured that no one would ever be able to break that. Then two years ago, someone released a free program that can decrypt the AACS encryption. But it was useless because in order to actually use it, you would need to know the key. And no one knew the key. And then, six months later, I saw a photo of two adorable puppies. And above them were 32 hex digits. And I wondered, why put those digits into a photo of puppies? I wonder if those digits are a key for something. And people put them together, I guess, because other people would redistribute the photo because of the cute puppies. And this way, the key could not be wiped out. And that's what it was. That was the key to break the axe. Somebody posted this on Dig, and the editors, obedient to the rules of the mega corporate empire, deleted it. And someone else posted it, and they deleted it. And after hundreds of people had posted it, they said, we've tried to obey, we give up. And after a couple of weeks, 700,000 websites had posted this in a strong outpouring of hostility to DRM. But that didn't win the battle because they, they changed the key. And meanwhile, although I believe that was enough to break the DRM on HD DVD discs, it was not enough to break the DRM of Blu-ray. Blu-ray has another level of DRM, which I believe nobody has broken yet. Uh, somebody has broken. Oh, really? It partially. Yes. Partially. Uh, yes. There is a for, there is a for-profit company that's broken, but well, that's not good. there is a if it's non-free software. I don't care if they make profit or not. There is free software as well that has broken it partially. 
Ah, uh, well, could you email me more information? I'll, I'll let you know. Email me more it's information. On the, it's on the Doom 9 forum. Uh, it won't help me. I, I don't have time to look through it. But if you could email me the actual information, I'd really appreciate okay. that. But in any case, they're working on it. I'm glad. I hope that they succeed. Uh, because these conspiracies to attack, our, to restrict the public access to technology, are an attack on our freedom. DRM always attacks your freedom at two levels at once. First of all, its purpose is to restrict your use of your copies of published works and take away from you what would otherwise be your legal rights. And second, as part of the mechanism, it means they make you use proprietary software to access the work even in the ways they choose to permit. And every proprietary program is also an attack on your freedom. This deserves to fail and we must make it fail. So the first level of response that is obviously called for is never accept any product designed to attack your freedom unless you personally possess the means to break the handy handcuffs and restore your freedom. So for instance, if you have the free software that can play a DVD, then it's okay to buy or rent DVDs or accept them as gifts. But if you don't have that, you should reject all DVDs that are encrypted. I actually don't have that program. So the only DVDs I have are DVDs that are not encrypted. I won't take the encrypted ones. Anyway, though I've told you about uh, digital restriction. Well, okay, that's the first level of response. The second level of response we should make is collective opposition. And uh, that we can do through the campaign defectivebydesign.org. That is our campaign of protests against DRM. Go to the site and sign up and you can participate in our protests. We need big protests because the goal is to show these mega corporations that if they design their products to attack our freedom, they will be hated. We have to teach them not to do it. In any case, I've been telling you about DRM on movies and videos, but we've seen it in other media too, for instance, music. Starting around a decade ago, we began to see things that looked like compact discs but they did not follow the standard of compact discs uh, because they were deliberately being written wrong so that they wouldn't be readable on a computer. We called these corrupt discs. And later they started setting them up so that they could be read, but only through particular proprietary non-free programs designed to restrict your freedom. Sony got in some hot water for their scheme for corrupt discs. For instance, well, here's, what it, here's how it worked. They designed it so that if you put the disk in a computer, it would install software in the computer, and this software resembled stuff that's inside of a virus or that crackers use to take control of the machine. It was called a rootkit. And what it does is it seizes total control of the computer and installs itself inside the operating system. Now, this, by the way, was a felony. Uh, and as many viruses do, it contained software to modify commands that you would use to investigate what's going on in the system so as to disguise its presence. And it modified other commands that you might try to use to delete it so that it wouldn't delete any, that if you tried to delete that. Uh, this was in addition, of course, to restricting what you could do with the data on that disk, on, on, on any of the Sony disks. Also, I don't know why, but I read that it's still the lib mp3 lame. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the, please, just let me give my okay. speech, okay? Okay. And that's, I mean, that was one felony, but Sony committed another felony, which was that part of the code of this program was free software that had been released under the GNU General Public License. Now, the GNU General Public License is a copyleft license, which means that when you make when you include some of this code in a larger program, 
You're allowed to do that provided you release the whole of the larger program as free software under the same license and you have to make the source code available to the users and you have to give them a copy of the license itself so that they know their rights. Well, Sony didn't do this and that was commercial copyright infringement. Of course, Sony was never prosecuted for this because our government is on their side in attacking our freedom. But people did sue Sony for this. Unfortunately, the criticism focused not on the malicious purpose of this scheme, but only on the other nasty things that Sony did as part of the means to achieve its malicious purpose. And this kind of criticized details of the means approach is often tempting, but it's fundamentally mistaken. Uh, Sony settled the lawsuits, promising that in the future, when it designs products to restrict our freedom, it won't do the other nasty things. And Sony has learned its lesson. In the future, the rootkit will be installed in the computer before you get it, and it will be impossible to remove, and it will be called the PlayStation 3. <laughs> and and the rootkit will be called AACS. So, <clears throat> focusing on secondary wrongs can help you win one battle, but it doesn't help you win the war. Now, we've seen, to a large extent, a retreat from DRM on music in the past few years. I hope that Defective by Design has helped bring this about. <clears throat> but we see fresh attempts to impose DRM on books. About a decade ago, the book publishers wanted to take away from book readers traditional freedoms to do things like uh, borrow a book from the public library lend it to your friend, <clears throat> sell it to a used bookstore, buy it anonymously by paying cash, and even the right to keep the book for as long as you wish and read it as many times as you wish and perhaps pass it on to your children who could then do the same things. <clears throat> They'd like to take, <coughs> take away these freedoms from us, but a head-on assault on these freedoms would be very difficult. There are millions of people that read books and would be likely to object. <coughs> so even though democracy is pretty sick in the U.S., it's not quite dead yet. So they conceived of a two-stage plan to achieve the same result. Stage one was to take away these freedoms theoretically, for e-books. And that they achieved with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And it didn't face much opposition because there weren't e-books and there weren't people reading e-books, so most people didn't pay attention. The second stage of their plan was to convince people to read e-books instead of printed books. And they tried that. Uh, there was a large, a massive PR campaign to convince people to use e-books. And uh, one publisher had the idea that they could get their line of e-books going with a real bang if they started with my biography. <laughs> <laughs> so the publisher found an author who came to me asking for my cooperation. And I said, I'll cooperate provided this book is going to be published without DRM. The publisher would not agree to that. So I suggested a different publisher who I thought would agree and who did. And not only that, the book was actually published free. That is to say, with the four freedoms. Of course, it wasn't gratis, not printed copies. They sold those and they sold a lot of them. Uh, but the text is also available on the internet and you are even free to, to according with free, to freedoms one and three, you can even publish a modified version if you wish. So, uh, 
uh, it's just one of the ironies of my life that the issues that I campaign about often arise in practice in the means that people ask me to use to carry out the activity. So I'm faced with situations where I have to choose between doing the thing that, that other people are asking me and pressuring me to do that would look advantageous or else living by my own principles. And what I do is I live by my own principles and I treat these as opportunities to show other people that they really have to follow these principles. That it's not just for everybody else. It's uh, that it's when it comes up in their lives too, it's important to do the right thing. In any case, ebooks flopped. They just didn't catch on. Not a lot of people bought them. And I wish I could convince myself that this was because people recognized ebooks as a threat to their freedom. But I was pretty sure that it was for some kind of practical inconvenience. And I said, they're going to try again. And now they are trying again. With products such as the Sony Shredder, they call it the Reader, but I think if we add SH, it, uh, the name becomes much more accurately descriptive of the effect. And the Amazon Swindle. <laughs> I call it that because it's clear Amazon doesn't want people to think about what they're going to be losing if people use this product. Imagine going to your friend's house and there are no books. And it's not that your friend never reads. The reason there are no books is he has ebooks instead, and they're all inside this little device he has. So, of course, it would be while you can walk up to the bookshelf and look at the books, we all do that, to pick up his electronic device and start looking through it would feel like intruding. And even if you found a book that you liked, he couldn't lend it to you. He'd have to lend you his whole library at once. And obviously, that's too much to ask of anybody. So not only will your friends be unable to lend you books, but they won't even, you won't even be able to browse their collections of books to see the books you've never heard of that you might be interested in. What a big loss that would be for society if we let it happen. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to use those devices. And you shouldn't either. So we see these attempts to establish the pay-per-view universe in all kinds of media, except where we have managed to, to to defeat the attempts. And of course, they keep trying again. Well, <clears throat> that's what's really happening in copyright. But what would governments do to copyright law if they wanted to serve the interests of their citizens? Well, they would reduce the power that copyright gives to the copyright holder. Maybe not eliminate it, but reduce it. And here are my specific proposals. First of all, the dimension of time. Uh, in the past few decades, as copyright has been made to last longer and longer and longer, the publication cycle has been getting shorter and shorter. Today, for instance, with books in the US, most books are, nearly all books, are remaindered within two years and out of print within three. So, I propose that copyright should last for 10 years, starting from the date of publication. Why the date of publication? Uh, because until the book is published, or the work is published, we don't have copies, so we're not losing anything if we're not allowed to copy the copies we don't have. So we might as well let the author or artist have as long as it takes to arrange publication. Why 10 years? Because that's three times and more the typical publication cycle that ought to be comfortably enough. 
But not everybody agrees with that proposal. I once suggested this in a panel discussion with fiction writers. And the award-winning fantasy writer sitting next to me said, 10 years, that would be intolerable. Anything more than five years is too much. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised too. You see, when the publishers demand increased power over us, they always say that they're doing this on behalf of the authors and artists whom they like to call, quote, creators, unquote a term which I believe they use because it subliminally suggests some kind of deity that deserves special powers. <clears throat> but in fact, at the same time as they cite those wonderful authors as the reason for more power over us, they are grinding those authors into the ground with their heels. Mistreating them and exploiting them is normal. Uh, for instance, what happened to this author. He had a dispute with his publisher. You see, his book contract said that if the publisher let the book go out of print, then the rights would revert to him. Well, as far as he could tell, his book was out of print, but the publisher refused to admit it and was using the copyright on his own book to stop him from distributing copies, which he wanted to do so that people could read his work. <laughs> Now this is what every author or artist starts out wanting. They want their works to be seen and appreciated. And most of them continue wanting this. A few of them, the very few who strike it rich, come to want money above all things. People like J.K. Rowling. They get corrupted morally by their success, but few have enough success to corrupt them. He still wanted people to read his work. He knew that more than five years of copyright was not likely to do him any good, but could do him harm. Well, I'm not necessarily opposed to his proposal. I suggest 10 years as a rough first, a pr first change, first step in solving, in making things better. And after we try 10 years for a while, we could see if we want to make it a little longer or somewhat shorter. I wouldn't be, if, if other people want five years, I won't argue against it. I don't claim that I know the perfect amount of time for copyright to last. It's meant to be the right order of magnitude. But what about the other dimension, the breadth of copyright power? Which activity should it control? For this, I distinguish three categories of works based on what kind of contribution they make to society, not based on what medium. That's the first thing people think of, but I think that this is a deeper kind of distinction. First of all, there are the works that serve a practical, functional purpose. You use them to do jobs in your life. Second, there are the works that tell you what certain people think. And third, there are the works of art and entertainment whose value is in the impact that they make. Three different ways that a work can contribute something to society. First, let's look at the works of practical, functional use. These include software programs, recipes for cooking, educational works, reference works, and some other things. These works must be free. Because if you use the work to do jobs in your life, then in order to control your life, you need to control the work. You've got to be free and have the wherewithal and have what is necessary to be able to change it. And once you have made a version of the work that works better for you, you've got to be free to publish that version because there may be other people who have needs similar to yours for whom the same version that's better for you would also be better for them. 
So you've got to be free to make your own versions and publish them. But it's absurd to say that people can publish modified versions but can't redistribute the unchanged version. After all, how big a change does it take to be a modified version? You could make a modification that looks big but doesn't effectively change anything. Why make people go to the trouble? It's absurd. So really, these works just have to be free. Now, some, we could imagine someone raising an objection and saying, but if we don't give up our freedom and let some copyright holders control us and as we try to use these works, they won't be made at all and will be totally lost. This council of despair and panic might have seemed somewhat plausible 20 years ago. At least we couldn't prove empirically then that it was false, but today we can. There's simply enough success in many areas to show that there's no cause for panic. There's no cause to act rashly out of despair. Look at the free software community. We've developed many thousands of useful free applications as well as free operating systems. And then look at all the recipes that circulate among cooks as if they were free. Cooks are, are accustomed to copying and sharing and changing recipes. Imagine if the state told all the cooks, as of tomorrow, if you copy or change your recipe, we'll call you a pirate, put you in prison. Well, then look at the free reference works, like, for instance, Wikipedia and others. And then in educational works, that one is lagging behind, but it's starting now. If you look at freetextbookproject.org, you can see that there are starting to appear textbooks which are free in the sense of the four freedoms. And I want to urge everyone interested in working on improving access to educational materials, do not settle for anything less than free in the sense of the four freedoms. If you go down a different path, you won't get to the same destination. If you accept a license which is not free, it will be very, very hard for you to get rid of it later. So you are building failure into the design of your project if you do that. So we can see empirically works will get made, and there are many ways that they can get made, respecting people's freedom, and we should tolerate nothing less. But what about the second category, works whose purpose is to show what certain people think? For instance, memoirs and autobiographies, essays of opinion, scientific papers. After all, the most important information in a scientific paper is actually the names of the authors, because those are the people who are saying, we did this, we saw that, our reputation is on the line. <clears throat> These papers are works of testimony. Now, for works in this category, to publish a modified version is simply to misrepresent someone else. I see no particular reason why that must be permitted. And once we decide that, there's no need to permit commercial redistribution at all. So I can propose a reduced compromise copyright system in which everyone is free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. But that's as far as it goes. All modification and all commercial use requires permission as now. Now this minimum freedom, which doesn't make the work free, but does make it shareable, which is a weaker criterion. This is the essential minimum freedom that we must have for any published work, because having this freedom will change copyright back into an industrial regulation that society can tolerate. Ha having this minimum freedom ends the war on sharing a cruel war designed just to ensure the supremacy of corporations over the public.
And for the works in this category, I think this minimum freedom is what we need. And thus, because commercial use would continue to be covered by copyright, the system would continue to provide revenue to the authors in more or less the same lousy and adequate way as it currently does. And what about the third category, works of art and entertainment? Well, for these works, I had to think for a long time about the question of modification because I see valid arguments on both sides. On one hand, there's the argument that the work can have an artistic integrity and modifying it can destroy that integrity. And I think that is sometimes true, although less often than the authors like to claim it is. Just look at how many of them will allow Hollywood to thoroughly butcher their works in exchange for enough money. But there are a few who won't allow that, and apparently they really do have artistic integrity. But on the other side, changing a work of art can be a contribution to art. Consider the folk process, where a series of people can transform a work and can produce something very rich. Then consider, if we wish to look at named known authors, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays used stories copied from other works that were published just a few decades before. If today's copyright law had been in effect then, those plays would have been infringing, and they wouldn't have been written, and we would never have seen or heard of them. And if Shakespeare, or whoever it was that really wrote those plays, had complained, the copyright holders would have said, Shakespeare just wants to make cheap rip-offs of our works, this is obviously going to be of no value to society, so it shouldn't be allowed. Now, since we have seen Shakespeare's plays, we say that he was a, or whoever it really was, was a great playwright, and that these works are important contributions to literature. But we can only be confident of this because we have seen them. If they had never been written, we couldn't be sure, could we? So it's important to recognize this as a reason to doubt the same claims when they're made by other copyright holders. However, what eventually enabled me to reconcile these two arguments was to realize that a modified version of a work of art can be a contribution to art, but you don't need to be able to publish it right away. We can afford to wait. When it's a matter of a work that you use in your life, you've got to be free to change it today because you may want to do that job today. And then you should be free to publish your version tonight because there may be other people who want to do that job tomorrow and they'll benefit from your change. That's because it's a practical work. But if you make a modified version of a work of art, and you think that it has artistic value, if we had to wait 10 years before you publish it, 10 years for the copyright to expire, it would be no disaster. It would still be a contribution to art. We can afford, in that case, to wait. So what I propose is the same for these works is the same reduced compromise copyright system where everybody's free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies but all modified versions and all commercial use require copyright holders' approval. And then after 10 years, the copyright expires and people can make their modified versions and publish them. So that's what I propose. As a separate question, an interesting issue today concerns remix, which is the practice of taking little bits out of lots of works and putting them together into a work that overall is totally different. Now, if the goal of copyright is to promote progress, it's obvious what we have to say about remix. It should be legal. It just should be considered non-infringing. This is another work. So this is one of the reasons why we should reject the term, the propaganda term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. That term carries bias and confusion. 
The bias comes from the word property because that, that word is meant to distort the way we think about whichever law is under discussion, in this case, copyright law. See, copyright was supposed to be for the benefit of the public, a scheme to artificially promote writing. If you judge copyright issues primarily in terms of the interests of the copyright holder, you're doing it wrong. And to presume that whatever benefits the copyright holder benefits the public, that's as stupid as what's good for General Motors is good for the USA. <laughs> but the worst problem in that term is a different problem. It's overgeneralization. Because that term is applied to many diverse laws. Copyright is just one of them. Then there's another law, patent law, which is almost totally different. The only thing they have in common is one sentence, the same sentence I read, I spoke to you out loud from the U.S. Constitution. That is the sum total of similarities between copyright law and patent law. Every detail is different. And yet there are people who make the mistake of trying to discuss both of these laws as if they were one question. And the reason they do this is because the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, has led them astray. And once they have gone astray like that, the discussion is garbage in, garbage out. You can't even see what the issues are of each of these laws when you pull back to such an abstract vision that you're talking about these two laws and a bunch of others all together. Because the issue, the public policy issues arise from the specifics of one law. When you try to generalize them all together, you don't even see what the issues are. Those conversations are ruined from the get-go because they're based on a misleading concept. And that misleading concept is, quote, intellectual property, unquote. This is why I'm not willing to try to look for another term to use instead. Because if you use another term instead, you can get rid of the bias that comes from the word property. People keep suggesting things like intellectual monopoly or intellectual whatever. Yeah, you replace the word property, you can get rid of the bias. But any attempt to describe all these different laws by one term is going to introduce the vagueness, the overgeneralization, and make it an abstract, irrelevant discussion instead of a real discussion about real issues. It gets even worse. You see, strictly speaking, these laws are called intellectual property rights. So what would intellectual property <coughs> refer to? They try, people try to imagine that you take all these dif disparate laws, which have practically speaking nothing in common, but then you imagine that they're all about the same thing. And what is this fictitious thing? It would be intellectual property. It's a construction of something that's purely imaginary. Best to just erase it from your thinking. Copyright law really exists. It really raises issues that do arise in our political system. And those issues are worth thinking about. And to think about them right, it's most important not to confuse them with other laws that do different things and raise different kinds of issues. Now, in my proposal, one effect is file sharing on the internet should be legal. That's the most obvious direct conclusion. The war on sharing must be stopped. The record companies would say that sharing is taking money away from the musicians. And you may have heard the saying that a half-truth is worse than a lie. Well, this isn't quite a half-truth. This is a more like a few percent truth. <clears throat> mostly falsehood. You see, when you buy some, the record of some musicians, 
in almost all cases, they don't get any money. They get zero. It's not just small, it's zero. When I buy a commercial CD, which is the main way I get any music, I am ashamed to realize I am not supporting the musicians. I know that it's likely not to be supporting the musicians. See, here's how, the, how it works. The contracts that the record companies impose on musicians who are starting out are extremely exploitative. They treat the production and publicity expenses as an advance to those musicians, which means that when you buy the record, yes, a certain fraction is nominally for the musicians, but the musicians never get it. It goes from one account in the record company to another account in the record company in order to, quote, pay back, unquote, the quote, advance, unquote. And it's very rare that a record sells so many copies that it finishes repaying this so-called advance and actually starts uh, providing money to the musicians. A record can go platinum without reaching that point. So there are only a few exceptions to this, and those are the musicians who finished their first record contract, which is five or seven albums, sufficiently famous that they have the clout to negotiate another contract that doesn't exploit them. And then the records they publish after that point, they'll really get some money if you buy those, but not their older records, because those are still under the previous contract. So it's the newer records of the long-established superstars that actually give them some money. And of course, these superstars are the people that the uh, record companies send as witnesses to testify in hearings about how to change copyright law. They're the ones we've heard of. So <clears throat> the way the other musicians really make money is from their concerts. Now this is not to say that they get no benefit from having a record contract, because the record contract involves publicity and the publicity could mean more people come to their concerts and they have more concerts. And this way they actually do make money, although I should point out that increasingly the record companies are getting their hooks into that too. If you buy something from, from the musicians at their concert, most of that money is likely to be going to the record company too. Of course, it depends on, on what kind of contract that band has. In any case, publicity for these musicians is useful, but there's more than one way to do publicity. Another way is somebody listens to some music and mails a copy to his friend. Sharing music is a way to give musicians publicity, and it's a healthier way, one that isn't controlled by hype. So I think it's better for music as well as better for us, and in the long term better for musicians. So I think that ending the war on sharing is not going to be bad for any musicians except that some superstars will get less rich. The main losers will be the companies <coughs> that have spent so much to attack our freedom. The companies that sue teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars and that have paid for laws to attack our freedom. And <coughs> bankruptcy and disappearance is what those companies deserve. Nothing less will be justice for them. I'm not against companies making and selling records. And if we had a system requiring such companies to actually pay the musicians, it might be a good thing. But the companies that have attacked our freedoms, the major record companies, they deserve to be eliminated for the evil they have done. Now, we might I, I think that uh, it's clear that the changes I proposed will not make the current lousy system of supporting artists significantly worse, but we might want to make things better. We might want a system that does a better job of supporting artists than the current one. I have two proposals for how to do this. One is based on taxes. 
You could tax something vaguely connected with internet access, or you could use general revenues, however you want to do it. The important thing is distribute the money direct to the uh, artists of various kinds and not to companies. And second, do it based on their, their popularity. And third, not in linear proportion. Because if you distribute it in linear proportion to popularity, well, Superstar A could be a thousand times as popular as capable, fairly successful artist B. And if you do it linearly, A would get a thousand times as much money as B, which means that in order for B to be supported adequately, we have to put lots of money into making some superstars rich. And that is wasteful if our, if, what, if our goal is to support the arts. So I propose doing it non-linearly, like you use a cube root function. If we use a cube root function, then if A is a thousand times as popular as B, A will get ten times as much money as B. Still more. There's still an incentive to try to get to be more popular and you'll get more money from this fund. But most of the money will go to supporting a large number of fairly popular artists. And all the superstars put together will still get just a small fraction of it. So the result is to use our money efficiently for the goal of promoting the arts. And we could do a much better job of supporting the artists paying less money. But some people don't like taxes, so I have another suggestion, and that is voluntary payments. Suppose each player had a button with a dollar sign on it, and you could push the button and it sends a dollar to whoever made whatever work you're currently playing or played last. And you could do this if you like, but nothing, for, nothing pressures you to do it. You don't get punished somehow if you don't do it. It's just there in case you want to. <coughs> But lots of people are going to want to, because lots of people really appreciate some works and really want to send money to the artists that made them. We're already seeing that voluntary payments do support some artists. Two superstar musical groups in the past year published albums and essentially on the internet and essentially said, pay if you want, otherwise share it. They got, these, they were Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails. They got hundreds of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> Monty Python recently put all its works up on a website for people to download. Their sales went up by a factor of 200. <laughs> and it's not just for very, very famous artists that this works. There's a Canadian singer called Jane Sibbery, or she was called that. Uh, I read that she changed, when I heard about her, because I'd never heard her music, I'd never heard of her at all, but I read an article saying that she has a website where she sells downloads of her music. And uh, I read that she lets people pay however much they wish, including zero if they choose. And on the average, she gets more than a dollar per track. Now this is interesting because the major record companies sell downloads for a little under a dollar per track. So the result is, by letting people pay or not, she actually gets more. And she does this without being a star. Raise your hand if you had heard of her before this talk. Two people. In my previous talk, nobody had heard of her. I had never heard of her before, except for this article. But a few months ago, I was speaking in Canada, and somebody said, said I'll give you a record of hers. And I like it somewhat. It's not my exact my cup of tea. But in any case, voluntary payments are working for her. I don't know how well they work, but they work better than the, than the music factory system would work. So, 
why might they not work? Well, it's just such a pain in the neck to give, you know, one dollar. You wouldn't miss a dollar. Why would you not push the button? Why, why would you not give a dollar to a band after you listen to a piece of music? It's not because you can't afford to give up a dollar. It's because it's so hard. Even though it's possible in some, in some cases, it's still fairly inconvenient. But if we made it super convenient, like having this button on every player, well, I think a lot of people would do it. Of course, some people wouldn't. Poor people who really can't afford that dollar, they wouldn't do it. And that's fine. We don't need to make poor people support the artists. There are enough non-poor people. Let them support the artists. Let the poor people not do it. Fine. We don't have to do, cut them out of enjoyment of all arts while they're poor. Uh, and we'll still be able to support the artists and keep them going, doing art. And if we wish that people would push the, this button more, we could have a kind, friendly PR campaign saying, did you push the button today to send a dollar to a, to a band or some artists? Why not? It's just a dollar. You'll never miss it. And didn't you love what they made? Push the button. And people would do it because this goes with human nature. People like the idea of giving something to artists. Compare that with the vicious and cruel PR campaigns of the war on sharing that try to tell you that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. <laughs> so, this is what I propose. And did you bring the boxes? Yeah. Because there's something in one of those boxes that I'm supposed to auction to benefit the Free Software Foundation. And there are other things to give away and to sell. We've got stickers that are all gratis. So, uh, and then there are various other things which are for sale. Open, please open, please open. This one's open, that one's not. So please, you open it. So we have for instance, copies of my book of essays, Free Software, Free Society, and we've got some t-shirts left. And we can take credit cards. In, in there, what do you, could you help us? Is there a big GNU by any chance? Oh, no, those are small gnus. Yes, this this big gnu is what I'm going to auction. And in there, there are stickers. Could you possibly take the stickers and just put them on the table so people who are leaving can take some? So this gnu. This adorable GNU <laughs> needs a home. And if you have a penguin, you've got to have a GNU. <laughs> because a penguin just can't do anything without a GNU. And so I'm going to auction this off to benefit the Free Software Foundation. And I'm going to start at $50. Do I hear $50 for this canoe? One dollar. I'm starting and bidding at $50. I've got 50. By the way, when you bid, speak up also. Shout, shout the number. So I've got 50. Do I get 55? I've got 50. Do I get 55? Do I get 55? Does anyone bid $55 to the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom for this canoe? Also raise your hand, so 55, do I get 60? I've got 55, I've got 60, do I get 65? I've got 60, do I get 65? I've got 65, do I get 70? I've got 65, do I get 70? 
70. I've got 70. Do I get 75? I've got 70. Do I? I've got 75. Do I get 80? I've got 75. Do I get 80? I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 85. Do I get 90? I've got 85. Do I get 90? Do I get 90? I've got 90. Do I get 95? I've got 90. Do I get 95? Do I get 95? Anyone bid $95 to defend your freedom? <laughs> Last chance. Do I get... I've got 95. Do I get 100? I've got 100. Do I get 110? I've got 100. Do I get 110? I've got 100. Do I get 110? Last chance. Anyone bid, bid 100? I've got 110. Do I get 120? I've got 120. Do I get 130? I've got 120. Do I get 130? I've got 120. Do I get 130? Last chance. Do I, I've got 130. Do I get 140? I've got 140. Do I get 150? I've got 140. Do I get 150? Do I get 150? I've got 150. Do I get 160? I've got 150. Does anyone bid 160? I've got 150. Last chance. Does anyone bid 160? I've got 160. Do I get 170? I've got 160. Do I get 170? Anyone bid 170 to defend your freedom? Uh, last chance. Do I get 170? Do I get 170? Going, going, gone. Woo! So the other things are for sale. The shirts are 20 and the books are 25. And we also have pins and key rings and buttons. Is there, would you like to sell them? Okay, so if you could put them up on a table up there. Yeah, the books too, the book and the shirts. And meanwhile, we'll answer questions. That's not for sale, that's just not for sale. And the canoes, there are small canoes for $20. He's going to sell them all. You got a question? Uh, I please be quiet some because it's time for people to ask me questions and I'm hard of hearing. And if you're all talking, I can't hear the question being asked. Sure. Um, I have a question about some of the things that go on in academia um, related to um, like restricting your freedom, like when you publish a paper to a conference, uh, there are a set of rules against, you, you lose a lot of rights, I think, uh, when you submit or publish a, a paper. With well, you should refuse to do that. Now, this is actually a fairly strong movement now to put an end to those restrictions, which are the enemy of science and the enemy of scholarship. Now, this is an interesting effect of the change in technology. In the age of the printing press, the journal publishers were the only way to disseminate scholarly work. They did an essential job. And the fact that they charged money for their copies, well, it was inevitable. It cost money to print each copy. And uh, so, <clears throat> so it was fine. But now, the best way to disseminate scholarly publishing is to put it on the net and let everybody copy it and let everybody redistribute it too Although, since these are works in the second category, they say what certain people think, I don't see that we should be allowed to publish modified versions of other people's papers. But we should all be allowed to redistribute exact copies of them. And this will help protect them from being lost. Uh, so, this should be allowed, but the journal publishers, having got themselves with a grip on the neck of the scholarly community, don't want to let go. So various people are looking for ways to break their grip. And so you should insist on open access publication, which by definition means A, anybody can download it, and B, they're also allowed to redistribute it too. I have filed an exemption 
for anti-circumvention exemption that would allow educators and students to legally de-encrypt DVDs for educational use. But I have well, to... Well, the problem is, the thing is, you're allowed to do so because that's fair use. Correct. The but problem is, you're not, we're not allowed to, legally to distribute to you the program you could do it with. So here's the funny thing, uh, Richard. You spent the last hour and a half, and only now have you mentioned the doctrine of fair use. You proposed an elaborate scheme to reduce the power of copyright when, in fact, we already have in place in Section 107 the doctrine of fair use, which actually is our power if we take advantage of it. Well, right. I don't you agree. You mentioned fair use in your talk, Richard. The reason is because I'm talking about something else. In general, uh, it doesn't seem like the courts regard internet file sharing as fair use. But internet file sharing is an essential part of the freedom I'm advocating. So, of course, I'm in favor of fair use, but I'm talking about going beyond that. But, you're, but in your talk, the ideas that you proposed about modification requiring permission, actually, that would seem to limit fair use. That seems to be a request. No, I'm not opposed to I mean, fair use. Remember, some kinds of, of ways of using a work are fair use, but a lot are not. And I'm not, a, I don't want to reduce fair use at all. I'm just sad that, in fact, the talk is over. And now I, I invite you to think about the message that you sent to the folks who left before this presentation was over, who, who, who thought they were getting an introduction, an understanding of the, the reason why copyright needs to change in the 21st century, and who left this session without understanding what the doctrine of fair use offers us as users under the I'm law. afraid I don't agree with you. First of all, because I can't explain to them fair use. I have to memorize a lot more that I tend to. I've read and I forget, of course. But the other thing is I'm talking about freedom that goes well beyond fair use. And that's the battle I'm trying to fight. Although DRM is designed to deny us fair use in a dishonest way. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act says you're not allowed to uh, break the handcuffs unless it's for fair use. But it also says you're not allowed to give people the means to break the handcuffs at all, ever. And the result is, even when they have an occasion where it is fair use and where they would, it would be lawful for them to use these means to break the handcuffs in one particular case, they can't get the tools to break them with because the distribution of those tools, like the free software that can play a DVD, is generally forbidden. And as a result, it's a dishonest way of taking away fair use rights. But I am advocating rights that go beyond fair use. It seems to me that if we empower citizens to take advantage of their rights under fair use, that will broaden the basis of support for changing copyright uh, regime I would, I, I think that it probably can't do any harm, but I would rather take the bull by the horns. I say sharing is good, we must be free to share. I don't want to limit my advocacy to fair uses defined by current U.S. copyright law and interpreted by the courts, although I'm entirely in favor of that. I don't want to limit my, I don't want to make that the center of my advocacy because I want to go beyond that. Yeah. Now, this is not related, but what what effect would uh, shorten copyright have on GPM? If we shorten copyright's duration, then that would affect anything, and copyrighted works, including copylefted works, because copyleft is legally based on copyright law, they would go into the public domain after that period of time, and anybody could then do whatever. with it whatever they wished. So the result is people would be legally allowed to take 10-year-old versions of copylefted programs and incorporate that into proprietary software. I could live with that. Okay. How, also, how do you feel about software that has source code released but, uh, and uh, you can distribute modifications but not the original source? And I don't mean, uh, I don't mean modified full source but like a diff. You know, that that barely manages to qualify as free software yes. because it, effectively you are distributing the modified version, but in a required cumbersome form. Okay. Because but it still allows people to distribute their modified versions. Tech works this way. Okay. 
And there are programs whose there are free licenses that do this. I don't recommend you use them, couldn't, but the programs are acceptable. Couldn't someone charge for the for uh, downloading the original source? Oh uh, no, because you have to be free to redistribute the original. I see. If if you're not free to do that, then it certainly doesn't qualify as free software. Well, they can still charge for downloads. I mean, free software lets you charge for anything. Yeah. You can charge for downloads. The question is, can other people redistribute? That's the real question. Yeah. Uh, during the last two election cycles, there have been some documentaries about um, voting machines and, and accuracy and things like that, and you know, auditing exactly how they work. So I just want to get your ideas about how we can implement countrywide uh, Open voting machines. I'm not, first of all, I'm not in favor of open software. I'm in favor of free software, software that respects users' freedom. It's okay. a different political position entirely, a different philosophy based on different values. Our value, the values of the free software movement are ethical values, freedom and social solidarity. When people talk about making things open, that's a way of rejecting our values. They only talk about practical values of convenience. I disagree with their values and that's why I won't join them. But in any case, to get to the substance of your question, uh, I don't think that's, in, that, that's enough. You see, voting is a very special case because the citizen has no way to tell whether her vote has been correctly counted. Right? You don't know when you leave the voting booth whether they throw threw away your ballot, or did the virtual computerized equivalent of it, or of that, or changing it. So, uh, and, and if they do, there's no way you can, it, it won't show up to you. So it's not enough to insist on free software in the voting machine. See, if there's non-free software in the voting machine, that means the manufacturer of the voting machine has power over the election authority. And you can't trust that manufacturer at all, so that's unacceptable. But suppose it's free software. That means that the election authority has full control. So now it's the election authority that can change your vote after you cast it. That's no good either. My conclusion is don't use computers for voting. <laughs> Society must be extremely cautious about adopting any new technology for voting. It should take us decades to adopt computers for voting. If we, now there are people who say that they have designed schemes that involve encryption such that we can all verify that our votes have really been properly counted. And we could verify that the, that the virtual ballot box wasn't stuffed and things like that. Well, maybe it's possible. If so, society can start very cautiously adopting it. And maybe in 50 years we could switch over completely if, if it looks like things really work. Because the, thing, the problem is that a practical scheme for using the technology is very different from a theoretical one. And there can be practical flaws, practical vulnerabilities to systematic theft of elections that you don't see when you look at it just in an abstract way. Only with experience gained over time can we tell if we've got a scheme that isn't vulnerable? Thanks. I got a quick follow up to what she said. Um, there's a general confusion on my sports that I've read that on Linux it's illegal to view DVDs. Well, actually, they're, they're mistaken when they say on Linux. They're talking about the GNU operating system together with Linux. Yeah. And uh, I don't know whether there is any software that you can legally distribute in the U.S. that will do the job, but it's not illegal to watch a DVD using the censored free software if you have a copy. Yeah, commercial DVDs, I think. Any. The point is, you have a right to watch the DVD at home. No matter what you, d you use to watch it, you're, you're, it's still allowed. Uh, but the thing is, no, it's not, it's not, it's just part of what's allowed, you know. They, the official authorized DVD players will let you watch it. So watching it is permitted. So no matter what you use, if you're just watching it, it's still permitted. Uh, what 
is not permitted is distributing that free software. Of course, you should do it anyway because it's ethical. Uh, the law is what's unjust. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I thought your um, distinction of different types of work in different categories and changing the rights based on these categories is very interesting. What I was wondering is, like, in, in many cases that I can think of, I don't think there's very, the assignment category is very clear. In fact, lots of work is bad categories. They might be educational and also entertaining. They might also convey. Oh, here's a solution to that. If a work seems to span categories, then it belongs in the category that gives the users the most freedom. Who makes the decision? A judge, ultimately, a court, right? Because remember, if somebody tries to enforce copyright, then the question will be, all right, which category is this work in? So is that is what that guy, the, the defendant is accused of doing something that infringes copyright law, so the court will have to consider, is it really permitted because of the category the work is in? And the criterion that makes sense is, since the authors have the control over what's in the work. If they didn't, if they don't want it to span categories, it's up to them to make sure it doesn't. Or they can divide the work into two parts. You know, if there's a part that is meant to be functional and a part that's artistic, well, they can split them apart, and then they can treat the artistic work as an artistic work because it clearly isn't functional. And so, one more, uh, one, one other question. I was wondering. What, what are the best ways to support this type of freedom? So, you know, you, obviously you can cre create software or other works and, and release one of these licenses and you can advocate your effective by design campaign. But for example, you know, financially, if you want to, you know, obviously the, the, the free software foundation. Well, for this, for this cause, we need to get laws changed. You see, with software, because software is a functional work, I was able to propose a purely technical way of freeing ourselves from proprietary software, namely write replacements and make them free. Because, you know, one kernel can replace another kernel, one C compiler can replace another C compiler, one text editor can replace another text editor. We didn't have to be able to free the kernel C compiler and text editor of Unix. We could write other ones and that would work. But one work of art doesn't replace another work of art. We can't gain for ourselves the freedom to share art by, by replacing all the existing art that's copyrighted with other art. Because one, one novel doesn't replace another novel and one song doesn't replace another song. So, just so we have to get the laws changed. We have to demand and we have to win these freedoms. And so as an individual, what's the best way to support this cause? At the moment, there isn't any organization working in a very strong way for this, for this change. You may have to start one. <laughs> yes, um, recently, the uh, major music labels have stopped suing individuals who use file sharing, or they've at least lowered My the understanding is the RIAA, which is their agent to sue people, is still doing so. They're, well, lowering, I was going to just say, lowering the publicity of using the file sharing, um, the lawsuits there. What they've now done after, I know Comcast, it's in the rumor that they're going after Comcast and trying to get Comcast to either uh, charge 99 cents per download on their, on their bill, on the person's user bill, or block the bandwidth and block the websites. That they're going to try attacking sharing one way or another, and no matter what they do, we should defeat them. They're also proposing a, a sort of corrupt version of my tax support for artists plan. And you can see it's corrupt because they talk about, quote, compensating the rights holders, unquote. Now the word compensate is meant to suggest that because we copied or used a work, we have a, a debt to someone. Now, I'm against that idea completely. I'm in favor of these kinds of schemes to support the arts. Support the arts, yes, except the idea that using a work gives us a debt. Absolutely not. But the other bad thing you can see in that is the term rights holders. That's the way they say the money's not going to go to any musicians. It's going to go to record companies. So that would be the wrong way 
to free up file sharing. I suppose it, if, if we think of it as paying a ransom to the people who are holding us hostage, maybe it's better than nothing. If that's the way we can get the war on sharing to end, but that's the wrong way to do it because we, we sh our taxes should go to support the artists, not the parasites. But then how do you prevent uh, artists who don't really do anything from getting supported? Well, you measure their popularity. Now, there are various ways of doing that. One is polling, or another is you know, some kind of what you could sample. You could ask people, are you willing to talk about which works you like? Okay, here's a gigantic list. Check off the ones that you like. Or are you willing to disclose which works you have downloaded? Okay, if you're willing, okay, we, 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 the software transmits the list, and you just add that together with everybody else. Uh, another scheme that uh, has been proposed by Francis Muguet uh, is let everybody allocate a certain fraction of his tax money to various artists, and that's how you measure their popularity. How much do people allocate to them? And then what about those people who don't want to give any money? They don't have to. Well, if, if it's a tax scheme, they'd end up paying the taxes anyway. Okay. That's fine. I don't, I don't see anything bad about that. You know, I pay taxes for roads. I don't have a car. And other people will pay taxes for music, and they don't listen to music. And others will pay taxes for TV and not watch TV. I don't care. This is a minor side issue. We've got to get rid of this stupid focus on, I paid $10 last year towards, which would be given towards musicians, and I didn't listen to any music, and I didn't copy anything. So what? Uh, it's harder to do it in software, and the reason is, well, first of all, software is in the first category. It should be free. And when software is free, you find lots of people contributing to it, and it's very hard to figure out how much. Suppose somebody wants to give money. It's very hard to figure out how to divide up that money among the hundreds or even thousands of people who have contributed. The, the people who have contributed to a GNU slash Linux distribution, there are probably 100,000 of them. How do you just, if, if I gave a dollar to, on behalf of GNU Sense, which is a GNU slash Linux distribution, how would it be distributed? How much would I get? How much would you get? I don't know. I don't know any way to figure these things out. All right, so um, there's this uh, claim frequently made by the GNU Foundation that I'm sort of... Well, there isn't one. That there's oh. no... Are you, are you talking about the Free Software Foundation? Yes, yes, yes. See, GNU is an operating system, okay. but the, there's the Free Software Foundation. And then they have the GPL. So there's a lot of free There's the GNU do. General Public License, which is the license that I wrote for the GNU project. All right, so um, there's this claim made by the uh, Free Software Foundation that I'm uh, sort of skeptical of, I guess. So I wanted uh, to see what you have to say. So, um, so there's this, so there's this claim that that free as in, this is frequently used, free as in freedom, but not free beer, right? Right. Now, if um, one of the freedoms is for other people, without your consent, to redistribute your software for whatever fee that they see fit, or yeah, it for is. Fees they choose, it is. what is, as an innovator in the present climate, what reason do I have to believe that I can make money off of my idea. I don't know if you have any reason. I don't care. You see, I'm, I think that's a, a side issue. Uh, maybe you can't make money from it. I'm not going to claim that you certainly can. But people need incentives. No, you're wrong. Uh, look at all the free software that there is. You're essentially arguing nobody would write free software because they need incentives and we can't offer them. And you're wrong because Empirically, you're wrong. Look at all the free software there is. People wrote that, and some of them had no incentives of the financial kind that you are talking about, and they wrote it anyway. Well, In fact, there are many motives for people to develop free software. One of them is political idealism. Another is fun. 
Another is to be admired. Another is to get a professional reputation as a good software developer. Another is gratitude to the free software community. Another is hatred for Microsoft. <laughs> now, I think it's a mistake to focus the hatred narrowly on Microsoft. Lots of other companies do something that's unjust, such as develop proprietary software. Uh, but still, it's a fact. A lot of people particularly hate Microsoft, and that motivates some people to develop free software. And another motive is money, because there are a substantial number of people who are getting paid to write free software. You can investigate how they're getting paid if you like. Uh, the point is, it's a fact. So, there may also be other motives I don't remember. The crucial point is, lots of people do this. You're trying to argue against facts based on a theory. And if there's any disagreement between the facts and your theory, what it shows is your theory is wrong. What, and I know how the theory is wrong. You're operating from a simplistic picture of human nature that says humans only want one thing. And actually, humans are a lot more complicated than that and want lots of different things. So don't believe any simplistic picture of human nature. I think I can answer that question a little bit. I work for a major corporation, I think, the administration. And a lot, a lot of my job is to make site-specific uh, programs right. used for their specific needs. So I'll take like an open source project that does something in a general sense, and I'll find it for a lot of companies. Yeah, a lot of the free software business consists of that. There are people whose business is making various adaptations and free programs, and the, the parts of these adaptations that are of general use go into the future versions, and the things that are just useful to one client, they hand over to that client as free software, and the client pays them because otherwise they wouldn't do this work. Just to make sure I understand your argument. So, in other words, you're willing to. I'm not saying this is uh, necessarily unreasonable. I'm just saying you are saying that you're willing to outright sacrifice the, um, the progress that would be made, that would be made solely for financial gain. Uh, no. What I'm saying is so called project progress which takes the form of proprietary user subjugating software is not an advance, it's harm. And I would rather that it not happen at all. The use of a proprietary program is a social problem. To develop the proprietary program is a power grab. If you have a choice between developing a proprietary program and developing nothing at all, please develop nothing at all. At least that way you're not doing any harm. Uh, so I literally consider proprietary programs an injustice. And I would rather oils be equal, but they, I'd rather get rid of them. Uh, and in general, if a person says to me, I can only make, I can make this technical advance if I make it proprietary, otherwise I can't make it. My, of course, they, people say this to me, and what they're trying to do is challenge me to prove that they can, that there is a way they can do it as free software. But I don't know their life circumstances. How could I claim there must be some way they can do it as free software? Maybe there isn't. But what I say is, if you can't do it as free software, don't do it at all. It's better to do nothing than to do harm. Uh, Richard, earlier I thought I understood that you're making a distinction between free software and the term open source. Yes. They're different can philosophies. Can you explain that? Okay. I founded the free software movement in 1983. In the 1990s, as GNU Linux became popular, there was, there was a split, a political split within the free software community. Some of us valued freedom and cooperation, and other people only value practical goals, such as having powerful, reliable, efficient software that you can get cheap. And in 1998, the second group coined the term open source as a way to talk about more or less the same software, but without ever alluding to our ethical ideas. Okay, but the license ties them together. Yes and no, because there are, you know, it's, there are, 
There are a lot of different free software licenses, and they, according to those open source people, they qualify also as open source licenses. But their criterion is written very differently from ours, and it's interpreted by different people, so of course the line doesn't come out in exactly the same place. And they have accepted some licenses that we consider too restrictive. Now, fortunately, these licenses are not used very much, so there are some programs which are open source but not free software, but there are not very many programs and they're not used all that much. But um, you're making an ethical distinction, that, but how does someone understand the distinction? You have to go back and research the history. I'm not making a distinction. These are two philosophies that are fundamentally different. If you look at what we say and you look at what they say, you'll see this difference that they only appeal to values of practical convenience, and they don't say that a program which is not open source is therefore unethical. They don't present it as a choice between good and evil. Whereas for us, that's the basic point. Either you're respecting people's freedom, or what you're doing is wrong. They don't want to say it's wrong, and that's the reason why they made a different term, precisely so they could avoid ever saying it's wrong. They don't want to say, to, to present this as a question, as a choice between ethical conduct and unjustified evil conduct, whereas that is the basic idea of free software. So this is a, the, the philosophical difference gets bigger the deeper you go. Well, how do you find a district? That falls on the free software. What? How do you find a, a GNU Linux distribution that, that falls on the free side? Oh, just look at GNU.org. We have a list. But even, well, but even Debian, you know. Distributes Debian distributes non free software, so we criticize them. Okay. Because if you, to distribute to, or some, a non-free program or to steer people towards a non-free program is to grant legitimacy to non-free programs. They believe they're being pragmatic. Well, yeah, so we're being pragmatic too, but our goal is to establish a world of freedom. And we know that whatever we do won't head for that world of freedom if the message it conveys is freedom is not important. Um, a while back, I forget the specifics of it, but I think in Congress and Larry Lessig was talking about it, there was, uh, they were discussing laws about abandoned works. Um, oh yeah, the orphan works laws. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they could be an improvement, but I think it's a side issue. We need the freedom to share every published work. And we're not going to get it through that orphan works law. That's basically a way of letting off some of the pressure so that they can defend their empire on the point that's most important. Also, are you, uh, are you familiar with the Grateful Dead music model? Are you a deadhead? Yeah, well, I, I, I wasn't particularly a deadhead, but I was aware of what they were doing, and it seemed to work for them. Uh, where do you see free software's relevance in the age of cloud computing? Is, uh, there, is we're not, we're, I'm not going to do cloud computing. Because, but the rest of the world is, so we're Well, I'm not sorry, no. The rest of the world is not, doesn't all agree with you. Okay, can you oh, answer if the you, question though? What? Can you uh, answer the question whether or not you know, just rather than dismiss it? Is available source code still relevant or is data- The only way to maintain control of your computing is to use your copy of a free program. If you use someone else's copy, in other words, if you use software as a service, you have let them have control over you, and you should never do that. Just as if you use a proprietary program, you've let the developer have control over you, and you shouldn't do that. The way to maintain freedom is to reject the things that would give it up. novelists to have the right to control their characters and 
Well, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that we have to limit that so that it doesn't get to the point of being evil. And that's why I proposed a reduced compromise copyright system. And that allows everyone to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. But it doesn't necessarily allow other people to uh, write uh, other novels with the same characters in the same universe because that is commercial, or probably it's commercial, and it's modification. So for those two reasons, according to my proposal, it would still be covered by copyright. Okay. But um, back in 1906, Mark Twain spent six months in Washington. Um, at the time, copyright only lasted 42 years. And after leaving Washington, he wrote an article in the New York Times and said, I want my works to protect my children but I don't really care about my grandchildren. They didn't, uh... Well, I don't sympathize with him. Uh, I don't see that... It's, I think that that's the wrong basis to make any copyright decisions. We shouldn't decide anything in copyright law based on what copyright holders want. It's a matter of what we want. Now, there's some benefit for us in promoting the arts. There can be benefit in having a copyright system but not because some author, author thinks he's entitled to certain power. That's not a, a valid reason why we should give it to him. Why shouldn't the writer have to work? Why should he? Work? Why shouldn't I be free to copy? If you want to create your own work, you're Why free. shouldn't I be free to copy my copy of his work? Why should he have any say over it? You have been brainwashed by the publishers and perhaps in the 19th century, the authors who tried to spread this idea that they were entitled to power over readers. But I reject that idea. However, I do see some validity in the idea in the Constitution of setting up an artificial scheme to promote writing. I do appreciate writing when I read it, and I'm willing to have a suitably, to live in a suitably designed scheme that promotes writing and that will call, by providing income to writers. I see the utility for all of us of having such a scheme if it is done in such a way that it's reconciled with the freedoms that we all wish to enjoy today. But I reject speaking as an author myself I reject completely the idea that authors should have power just because it seems to them that they deserve it. Well, to use a specific example, about two weeks ago, um, an author, a writer in California has said that they were going to create their own sequel to the Twilight novels, and has said that, and has tried to explain why it's fair to use, to use those characters. Now, though this writer is not able to use it, those the characters are not in the public domain. Uh, but, I'm not necessarily on his side in that, but under my proposal, copyright on each of those novels would expire in 10 years. However, uh, a successful series can go much longer. Than That's fine, but the point is, the, the, when the copyright on the first novel in the series expires, then the characters in that series could be used by others. But that won't stop the author who wrote the first book from continuing to write more books in that world. And that author will probably have a lot more success than the others, after all, because the people who like that world will appreciate that author. I think, I think it's time for me to respond to someone else. I want to come back to the first question about uh, copyright in academia. So I'm a young scientist myself, and I find myself very conflicted because I admire your idealism, and I kind of want to follow suit. But I, you know, for many prestigious journals, I'm asked to to um, transfer my copyright, and I'm also asked to uh, to support publishers by reviewing work that that is published there under their copyright terms. And basically, the decision I'm faced with is like comply with this and get my works published in these journals and, and you put on my resume that I do review work for, for these journals. It's time for you to display courage. 
Well, what else do you need to do? <laughs> it's time for you to display courage and to refuse to review for journals whose policies you disapprove of is easy. But the next step is this university should adopt a policy requiring the, well, actually the university should reserve to itself second publication rights on the internet of the author's final version of any published scholarly works. And the university should promise that when it publishes them, it will permit everyone to redistribute, at least not commercially, copies of what they publish. And by putting this into the contracts that it has with the faculty and staff, and when possible with the students, the university will simply take it out of the hands of, uh, of the journal publishers. And meanwhile, professors competing for tenure will be under the same rules. So it'll be fair. Mm. I agree with that. I, I, I hope that's tough. But doesn't that go to the heart of like, the problem with like, the university system in this country in the sense of publisher parish? My friend used to always say... You no, actually, I disagree with you. I think I've just found a solution to reconcile solving this problem with the university system. No, I so I disagree with the claim that this is an inherent problem. No, no, I guess one thing, the inherent problem is the, pro is the profit motive of the university instead of the education motive of the university. The I, that's going too far afield for me to want to go that far. Yeah. I have no opinion about that. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the Creative Commons and how does it fit within your proposal? The Creative Commons licenses all permit at least non-commercial distribution of exact copies. So they're all ethical to use, in my opinion, on works in the second and third categories. Two of them are free licenses, which makes them okay for works in the first category. What Creative Commons does not have is a philosophy advocating any particular kind of freedom for users of works. The GNU, the, the GNU GPL stands for GNU General Public License. Right. That is a license I wrote right. for software, mainly, but can be used for some other things. But does it specifically spell out this ethical issue? Yes, it does in the preamble. It explains why the license gives you these freedoms. It's because uh, you deserve them. Um, can I just ask a clarification? You said that you think we should be allowed to file share music, but do you think we should actually do that at this point? I see no harm in it. <laughs> I, I, see, I see nothing but good in denying money to the, record, to the major record companies. Just besides the fact that it's not really legal? Oh, that's not, that doesn't make it wrong. No, I don't. And the reason is, I think I might very well be singled out as a target to attack lately. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for you to have courage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if there's anybody who can fight that battle, sir, it, it'd be you, wouldn't it? No, actually, the thing is, under current laws, I don't know if anybody can win. Uh, I wouldn't say to you, I wouldn't presume to judge for you the question of whether you want to do file sharing or whether you're scared of the RIAA. Well, I mean, that's, I'm not going to say you should ignore their threats. What I will say is there's nothing unethical about file sharing. So you mentioned operating systems earlier and that you really don't like Debian. You have criticisms because they let you use it's not that they let you, it's that they lead you to it. Any general purpose system will let you install any program you like, which includes non-free programs. So what are your, what's your personal favorite operating system? Uh, I don't want to say a personal favorite, because I, it wouldn't be very fair. Uh, I endorse the systems that don't steer users towards non-free software. And those include, for instance, Ututo, 
uh, Blag, and GNU sets, all of which are versions of the GNU slash Linux system. Can you give an example of, um, I might have missed that part of the conversation, but what software specifically does Debian? Uh, oh, Debian has non-free software in two ways. First of all, there is a non-free section and a contrib section. The non-free section contains non-free software. The contrib section contains programs to help you install non-free, specific named non-free programs. Like, there'll be a contrib package for a given non-free program. Here's the contrib package to help you install it and run it. Well, both of these are steering people towards and legitimizing non-free programs. The other thing is, in the version of Linux used in Debian GNU slash Linux, there is non-free software. And a few months ago, they had a vote about whether to remove that before their recent release, and they voted not to remove it. Are you talking about binary drives? I'm drive talking about firmware blobs that are part of Linux, the kernel. Oh. Would you be okay with the firmware blobs being not part of the kernel, but loaded after? No. They're, okay. they're non-free software. Is there a way to go around firmware blobs without having the hardware manufacturers? Only reverse engineering. Yeah, that's right. Is there any RPM-based distributions that do what you said? Uh, Blag, probably, but I don't actually know. You see, I know that Blag was made from Fedora, but aside from that, I've, I've never actually seen it. By the way, Blag stands for Blag, Linux, and GNU. So this is enough for questions. I'm done. Oh, I have one other question that I think is very important. How do you feel about the university requiring in their information science and technology program a year of uh, Microsoft specific program? It's an injustice, and they shouldn't do it. Well, they do. What? They do require PT.net. Oh, well, that's, 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 students should, should refuse to take it. I'm serious. Well, students should get together and say, this is unethical. Give us a way to do to show our knowledge of equivalent materials, but with free software. And this this must be raised as an ethical issue, I see. not as a matter of convenience. Doesn't ACES hate? If it were just a matter of convenience, that wouldn't be a sufficient argument. I see. So you owe me some money for. I know. The